Hello, welcome to my Pipeline Integrity video series. I'm your presenter, my name is Colin Scott. I'm a, I'm a Pipeline Integrity Engineer uh, based in Calgary, Alberta, up in Canada. Uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you uh, essentially an update and a, and a revision of one of my previous videos. About two years ago I posted a video called Pipeline Integrity, Things That Make Me Go Hmm. It's a seven part series. This is an actually an update and a revision to part two of that series. And the reason I'm updating it is because I recently found uh, some new data that comes into play, so I'd like to update some of my results and conclusions. Now, in that previous video, I was looking at the analysis of long flaws and, and specifically looking at localized corrosion. If you've seen some of my previous videos, I do have some uh, concerns with the mathematical and theoretical basis of the uh, NG18 equations, and specifically the ASME V31G equation. So here I'm showing the top equation, which is an industry standard. If you're working with an NG18 based equation, uh, ASME V31G, uh, corrosion assessments following API 579, British Standard 7910, or DNV recommended practice F101, you'll see that the remaining strength of, of a given localized corrosion flaw um, as it gets longer and longer, becomes proportional to the remaining ligament. And that's shown in the above equation. However, over the last uh, three or four years, I've been working on my own methodology, which I call the, the GEM methodology. And in this, I predict that the remaining strength of a localized corrosion flaw will actually tend towards the square root of the remaining ligament. Now, this goes against common sense, but there actually is a theoretical rationalization behind it. Uh, and I'd just like to clarify this is for localized corrosion, and specifically I'm looking at long flaw analysis. I'm looking at the, the limits of the mathematics. In the previous video, I presented this plot. On the y-axis, we have the remaining strength, which is defined as the failure strength divided by the flow strength. And on the x-axis, we have the flaw depth ratio, uh, the depth normalized by the wall thickness. Now, you see within this plot, I have a red dashed line representing the limit of the NG18 based equations for long flaws. So that includes ASME V31G uh, and API 579, British Standard 7910, and the DNV standard. And then I'm also showing the limits for uh, both short and long flaws using my uh, new GEM methodology. And specifically, you'll see the curved uh, green dashed line in the middle of the plot represents the square root relationship of the remaining ligaments. And that's what I have uh, discussed in my previous videos as being the limit for uh, long flaws. Now, if you see these uh, blue squares, these are all uh, data points taken from the industry literature. And what you'll see is that they are all above or equal to uh, my gem long limit, indicating uh, from this data that my square root relationship uh, appears to be valid. Now, I've since found a lot more data to add to this plot, so i just like to update this video, as I mentioned before, uh, and show you how the new data comes into play. Now, the previous data that I've presented and I showed you on the slide just before came from uh, the Battelle uh, studies from the early 1970s uh, and from Cronin data, uh, which was work done by uh, Dwayne Cronin as part of his doctoral thesis at the University of Waterloo uh, in the year 2000. Now I've since updated with quite a few more data points which I found in a PRCI report uh, and that provides data from several other studies specifically from uh, GL Industrial, Petrobras, the Korean Gas Company, British Gas, Nat Gas, and Transgas. The grand total of all this data amounts to uh, over 300 data points, so that really is a substantial improvement over my previous video. What I've done is I've taken all of that data and I've uh, applied it to the previous plot just to see if anything changes. Let's see what happens. Here I have essentially the same plot that I showed you in the, in the uh, previous video. On the y-axis we have the remaining strength ratio, defined as the failure strength. Uh, divided by the flow strength, and on the x-axis we have the flaw depth ratio. Uh, as before, I've got a red dashed line representing the uh, NG18 based equation, so specifically here uh, the ASME V31G type equation, uh, and I've also got a green dashed line representing my new GEM methodology, which uh, uh, 
predicts that we will have a square root relationship with our remaining ligament. Now, uh, one thing I should point out is the data that was uh, presented in the pre-RCI report was in a slightly different format to some of the previous data that I had shown. Uh, I've decided to replot everything using the new format, and that tends to be a little bit more conservative than the previous work. So if you compare the flow strengths of the zero depth flaws, you'll find that in this case, everything is a little bit more conservative. So please bear that in mind as we go forward. Now, you will notice that there are a lot of data points here between the red dashed line and the green dashed line. And it would appear on the surface that this uh, disproves my theory. Um, I'm sure a lot of you will have uh, a few things to say about that, and I, I completely um, understand that uh, many of you will draw that conclusion. However, I'd like to show you something that comes out uh, of this data that I find to be extremely interesting. This data included a series of machined flaws, specifically uh, ring tests in which a ring of pipe was cut out, a flaw was machined into that ring, and then the ring itself was tested, as opposed to being a hydro test with a full section of pipe. And then there were some flat bottom flaws that were machined into sections of pipe before hydro testing uh, that, to my mind, provide a uh, noticeably different uh, geometry than would a natural corrosion flaw. You'll see here that of these machined flaws, they tend to be scattered uh, all over the plot. Uh, everything is above the red dashed line representing the ASME V31G limit. Now, you might think that this disproves my theory, and you may well be right. However, let's take a look at how the real corrosion flaws behave. When we look at the real corrosion flaws from the database, they are mostly, I admit not all, mostly above my square root relationship limit. We have one, two, three, four, five, six of these data points that are below my limit, and some of you will say that this disproves my methodology. You may well be right. I think if we look at this from a statistical perspective, uh, we will recognize that when you have a larger and larger data set, there will be some outliers that, uh, that appear to uh, disprove the theory. Uh, I've looked into the data points here that are below my curve, but I don't have sufficient information from the PRCI report that I have review reviewed uh, to see if there's some reason that we may well be able to discount these for one reason or another. Uh, although there are some data points that cross uh, my gem limit, I do feel that the overall behavior of these data points, when compared to the machine data points, uh, still, still provide some validity to my methodology. I will point out that if you look at the derivation that I've put together uh, that looks at the theory behind uh, stress analysis of blunt flaws, you will find that there will be differences expected between the corrosion flaws and the flat bottom machine or ring type flaws. As far as this goes, I feel that uh, although there are some outliers here, I still feel that my methodology uh, maintains some validity. Now, you may be wondering why I, I believe that this matters so much. Uh, I've put together more than one video on this particular topic, and it seems to be uh, uh, something that I'm concerned with. Um, and let me explain that people have told me that ASME B31G is, is a conservative model, and therefore it's suitable for pipeline integrity calculations. Uh, I think maintaining safety within the pipeline industry is obviously a very good thing. However, what I do recognize here on the bad side is that overspending on unnecessary repairs is bad. The people that say conservatism is good and we should uh, dismiss any problems associated with B31G are generally the people that are not actually paying the bills on these unnecessary repairs. Uh, choosing to repair uh, flaws that don't need it for technical reasons leads to a misprioritization of your mitigation resources and that I don't think leads to a particularly efficient pipeline integrity program if you're a pipeline operator. Uh, demonstrating that the mathematics of the B31G equation is wonky also indicates that we're thinking with some uh, wonky me mental models. Uh, and that is going to lead to some problems when we're tro troubleshooting issues. I've done uh, quite a bit of my career has been involved in research. And uh, the data here tells me that if we're doing research studies that are relying on machined flaws, that seems to be leading to some questionable conclusions. 
the questionable conclusion specifically that the linear behavior of the remaining strength as shown by the machine flaws is substantially different to what we're seeing from the actual natural corrosion flaws. Uh, and so we've got some questionable conclusions coming out of those research studies. I'll also say that I've seen some research studies that rely on V31G as a basis of normalization um, to other data. Now, if we know that we've got some wonky mathematics in the model that we're using for normalization, then uh, that's going to lead to us having some uh, wonky um, conclusions potentially coming out of other research studies. So I think that these are things that we really need to think about. It's not just a matter of conservatism and, and, and saving money or spending money. It's a matter of how are we thinking about these various issues moving forward with industry research programs. Let me give you a, an example to see um, how expensive the V31G uh, mathematics can be for a typical pipeline operator. So con consider that we have a situation with a grade X52 uh, pipe steel and we're running at 72% SMIs. This is going to be a pretty common situation for a lot of the pipeline operators. Now if we do the mathematics on this, we'll find out that the, uh, the remaining strength limit for this pipeline will be at 60%. If we take a look at our plot and we consider our ASME B31G limit, that would mean that we would have a critical flaw depth ratio of 40%. So any corrosion flaw on that pipe that grows to 40%, provided it's long enough, will become critical and becomes a very serious uh, rupture hazard. Let's see how things change if we consider the GEM methodology. If we look at the same example looking at the GEM methodology, we'll find out that while the ASME B31G methodology would predict that a 40% deep flaw would be right at a critical point of rupture, or failure at least, uh, the GEM methodology demonstrates that we would have a safety factor on that flaw of 1.28, which means that we've got substantially uh, more time to respond to a, a mitigation effort than we perhaps think that we have. If we extend this further, we can say to ourselves that the remaining strength uh, ratio of 60% will not become critical under the GEM methodology until we have a flaw depth of 64% deep. That's for a long flaw. So essentially what we have when we work to a 40% deep flaw is we're actually, uh, we have an implicit 1.60 safety factor just based on depth. Now if you think about it, that is quite a lot. And when you think about it, that will apply for every one of the flaws that is identified on your pipe, which may amount to, uh, in some cases, tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of flaws on, on a single length of pipe. When it comes to looking at your mitigation budget and how you're uh, putting your resources into play, I think that you would find that that adds up very, very quickly. If you think about it, this uh, NG18 based equation is used in the original ASME B31G model, the modified B31G model. It's used in R string, P squared, API 579, British Standard 7910, and DNB's recommended practice F101. So when you think about it, all of these models are predicting uh, remaining strengths of long flaws tending to uh, a remaining ligament in a linear fashion as opposed to the square root fashion that the majority of the data demonstrates is valid. I'll also point out that this is really just the list of corrosion models that use that uh, B31G based model. Uh, it's also used in uh, various cracking models, though that opens a whole other can of worms. I'm going to give you a couple other things to think about here. We tend to assume that the failure strength of a longer flaw will be substantially shorter than that of a, a shorter flaw, but that's not necessarily the case. Here I've taken the various data points and I've plotted the remaining strength ratio um, for the real corrosion flaws. Um, and I've plotted those against the flaw length parameter, uh, which is proportional to the length divided by the square root of the diameter times the wall thickness of the pipe. Now, according to industry theory, and specifically the B31G approach and the Foley's factor approach, 
we would expect these longer flaws to be substantially weaker than the shorter flaws. However, when we put a trend line through all of these data points, we find out that it's, uh, it's not actually the case. Uh, here we see that the uh, length of the given flaws is, is almost arbitrary uh, in terms of what the failure strength of that corrosion flaw is going to look like. So that's something that we really should have a good think about. The length is not nearly as important a factor as we think, seem to think it is. Now I do recognize that a lot of you are fans of B31G and the NG18 approach, or you may be using some of the other models that use this methodology. Um, there's nothing I can do to stop you from doing that other than to encourage you to think about uh, my GEM approach. Um, if you are really fixated on ASME B31G, but you do recognize that my, my data shows you that there uh, is some wonkiness there, one thing that you may consider doing is truncating your foliage factor to two. Here I've got a yellow dashed line that represents a foliage factor of two, and that provides a realistic limit to all of these data points that have been provided by uh, industry literature. So going forward, uh, this provides you some degree of evidence that any foliage factor, any length and any foliage factor uh, beyond uh, two uh, is probably not entirely necessary to maintain uh, integrity of your pipeline. That'll give you something to think about. So you can probably tell that I've been thinking about this for a little while. Um, I'm constantly trying to find more data to think about how I might plot things differently and how I might challenge my own conclusions going forward. Um, sure, some of you have some thoughts on how I might plot the data differently, or you may well have some data that comes into play that I'm not aware of. At this point, I'm going to stand by my square root relationship, uh, despite the fact that I do have, uh, what was it, five or six data points that come in below my line. I think that the, uh, the difference between machine flaws versus uh, corrosion flaws is very real and significant, and I'm going to uh, maintain my methodology going forward. If you're interested in some further study, I do have uh, two other uh, YouTube videos that have been posted. One is the, uh, the previous version of this, which is Pipeline Integrity, Things That Make Me Go Hmm Part 2. And the second one is uh, I've put together a video that explicitly describes how that square root of the remaining ligament term uh, gets derived. It's not something that I pulled out of my tail. It's something that comes out of uh, crack analysis and specifically blunt crack analysis. So please take a look at that. I do also have some real publications through AMP, uh, through NACE, and uh, I've actually got a couple others through ASME and Journal of Pressure Vessel, uh, pardon me, uh, Journal of Pipeline Science and Engineering for those of you that uh, want to dig a little deeper. Please take a look at those if you're interested. I hope I've given you a couple of things to think about. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, follow up through either uh, YouTube or you can find me on LinkedIn. I'd be glad to talk about this and uh, hopefully together we can uh, uh, work towards making the pipeline integrity business uh, a lot more efficient. Thank you very much for your time. Have a nice day.